The tale commences with a hunter locked in combat against monstrous adversaries. Amidst the fray, an eagle-like beast swoops down upon the hunter, only to meet its end swiftly at the hunter's hands. This hunter, renowned as Ravenvault, bears the moniker of the Immortal Crow and is feared far and wide for his prowess. As Raven dispatches the monsters, thoughts of freedom tantalize him, for a mere fifteen days remain until potential liberation. Determined, Raven envisions his escape from this perilous existence. The narrative then transitions to the campsite of the Rakshasa units, where Raven seeks refuge. Reflecting on the past decade, each day is felt akin to hell. The Rakshasa units, stationed in a realm embroiled in perpetual conflict with monsters, is regarded as a lowly unit, its ranks filled with societal outcasts, slaves, and criminals. It's a place where life holds little value, inhabited by individuals who have resigned themselves to their fate. Overheard conversations among a few men lament Raven's leadership, attributing the deaths of his comrades to his decisions once again. In the aftermath, Raven emerges as the lone survivor once again, prompting whispers among his peers about his remarkable resilience despite his aristocratic background. A confrontation ensues when a man confronts Raven about his unresponsiveness to calls, to which Raven responds with a smirk, questioning the man's eagerness for a swift demise. With a swift kick to the stomach, Raven asserts his dominance before drawing his sword, poised at the man's throat. Yet, in a surprising turn, Raven relents, retracting his blade and shoving the man to the ground before departing. Within the confines of the Rakshasa unit's camp, tales circulate about Raven's unlikely journey, a former nobleman who has defied the odds, surviving a decade in a unit notorious for its high mortality rate. These whispers hold truth, for Raven was indeed once a scion of the esteemed Vault family, albeit not among the most illustrious. However, the fickle hand of fate stripped Raven of his status and possessions, leaving him to navigate the harsh realities of his new existence. The narrative then delves into events a decade prior, when the Vault family faced damning accusations of plotting against the Empire. As the Empire's forces dismantled the family, Raven, too, found himself ensnared by the guards. In a fervent plea, he vehemently denies his family's alleged treachery, insisting they were innocent victims of a larger conspiracy. However, an Empire knight rebuffs Raven's defense, chiding him for his family's purported transgressions. Despite Raven's protestations, the knight reveals that the vault lineage, save for Raven himself, has been extinguished. In a surprising turn, the knight offers Raven a proposition, endure ten years of service within the Rakshasa units, and his life shall be spared. Raven is taken aback by the unexpected reprieve. Meanwhile, among the nobility, laughter erupts at the notion of a nobleman like Raven being consigned to the Rakshasa units, a unit regarded as the empire's lowest, filled with criminals and societal outcasts. The nobles ponder how such a fate could befall one of their own. The nobles anticipate the demise of the Vault family, yet Raven Vault defies expectations with a resolute decision. Meeting the knight's gaze, Raven solemnly inquires if surviving ten years of monster slaying is all that's required. The knight confirms, promising Raven freedom thereafter. Determinately, Raven pledges to not only survive but also resurrect the Vault lineage. Returning to the present, Raven contemplates the imminent end of his indignity. Since joining the unit, he has faced monsters devoid of training or experience, merely striving to endure. Over the span of a decade, Raven, once a mere youth, has ascended to become the Rakshasa unit's premier monster hunter. With the next monster purge slated to be his last, Raven believes freedom and the restoration of his family lie within reach. Meanwhile, the scene shifts to the Ancona Forest in the Pendragon Duchy, where a white dragon addresses a yellow-haired noble. The dragon forewarns of the dwindling time before a pact is fulfilled, setting an ominous tone for what lies ahead. Dragons, revered as the mightiest creatures on earth, hold a unique status among monsters. Only one family possesses the power to subdue these formidable beasts, the Pendragon Ducal family. Renowned for their ability to tame dragons, the Pendragons wield immense political influence, ranking among the empire's most prestigious noble houses. As the narrative shifts to 13 days before Raven Vault's impending pardon, he enters the command tent of Balti, the Rakshasa unit's commanding officer. Balti questions Raven's solitary return once again, seeking a report on the reconnaissance mission. Raven reports a significant concentration of monsters ahead, warning of the dire consequences if they unite with their main forces. Balti acknowledges the peril, conceding that the Rakshasa units alone stands little chance against such odds. However, Hope arrives in the form of the Pendragon Ducal family. Balti reveals that they will come to their aid tomorrow, 
bolstering their ranks against the impending threat. The prospect of Pendragon assistance brings a glimmer of optimism amidst the looming danger. Furthermore, the Pendragon family is bringing along one of the most powerful creatures known to mankind, a dragon. Startled by this revelation, Raven questions Balti as to why such a mythical being would deign to fight alongside them. Balti assures Raven of the truth, explaining that the Pendragons have mastered the art of subduing dragons across generations. It appears that the White Dragon will be tasked with vanquishing the monsters. Raven reflects on the Pendragon's significance. Not only do they boast royal lineage, but they also hold the highest noble rank in the Empire. While uncertain of the veracity of these claims, Raven ponders the Pendragon's rumored ability to command dragons, creatures bordering on legend. Despite a decade of confronting monsters, Raven has never encountered a dragon, leading him to question Balti's reliance on such tales. Moreover, rumors suggest that the Pendragon family's influence has waned since the demise of their predecessors. Raven remains skeptical, unsure whether to believe in the Pendragon's supposed power. Raven expresses his distrust of the Pendragons to Balti, who dismisses Raven's concerns, citing it as an order. Balti reassures Raven that he won't be required to fight the following day. Perplexed, Raven queries Balti's intentions, to which Balti explains that with a dragon on their side, it's wise to let the dragon handle the monsters while Raven guards the Pendragon child. Raven seeks clarification on whether this task is sufficient. Balti emphasizes the importance of Raven sticking by the Pendragon child's side at all costs. Raven acquiesces, agreeing to follow Balti's instructions. Balti then instructs Raven to personally greet the future Duke Pendragon. Approaching the Pendragon tent, Raven observes the family's flags, confirming their presence. He muses on their desperation in aiding the Rakshasa units. Despite the impending battle, Raven remains indifferent to the outcome, prioritizing his survival for a chance at pardon and freedom. Entering the tent, Raven calls out for the young lord. In response, he hears a voice that startles him, its otherworldly quality leaving Raven momentarily unsettled. Despite this, Raven offers an apology for his unannounced presence and seeks confirmation of the individual's identity as Lord Pendragon. The voice affirms Raven's suspicion, confirming his assumption. Requesting Raven's name and purpose, the voice prompts Raven to introduce himself as the captain of the 12th Division of the Rakshasa units. Raven explains that he's been tasked with guarding Lord Pendragon in the upcoming battle. However, before Raven can proceed further, the voice interrupts, dismissing the need for Raven's report and advising him to rest for the following day. Unperturbed, Raven hesitates to leave, prompting the voice to inquire if he has additional matters to address. Seizing the opportunity, Raven inquires about the absence of the dragon, questioning its crucial role in their combat strategy. The voice reassures Raven that the dragon will indeed assist them and bids him to depart. Accepting the instruction, Raven exits the tent, pondering the curious quietness of Lord Pendragon. He questions the likelihood of a nobleman venturing alone to a place like the Rakshasa units. Nevertheless, Raven resigns himself to the notion that their paths will likely never cross again after tomorrow's battle. The following day, Balti rallies the assembled forces, signaling the time to advance. Suddenly, an explosion rocks the scene revealing the arrival of a white dragon. Raven is struck with awe at the sight. Alongside the dragon emerges Lord Pendragon, introducing himself as Aaron Pendragon. With resolve, Aaron declares the commencement of the monster extermination. The narrative shifts to the midst of the monster battle, with Raven diligently protecting Aaron Pendragon. As a pack of wolf monsters closes in on them, Raven confides in Aaron, admitting his unfamiliarity with combat while safeguarding others. He implores Aaron to refrain from unnecessary movements. As the wolf monster launched its attack on Raven, he swiftly retaliated, effortlessly taking down the entire pack with a single, precise strike. Glancing skyward, he marvels at the dragon's effortless prowess, astonished that such a creature truly exists. Raven acknowledges the unmatched power of the white dragon, realizing that no monster can withstand its destructive capabilities. Despite the multitude of monsters, the dragon's intervention ensures a smoother battle than ever before. Raven attributes their success to the dragon's formidable presence, grateful for its assistance in turning the tide of the battle. Their victory seems almost certain, prompting Raven to consider himself fortunate that the last mission wasn't more challenging. As the white dragon touches down near Aaron Pendragon, Raven inquires about their well-being, to which Aaron reassures him that they are unharmed. Suddenly, eagle monsters descend from the sky, catching Raven's attention. Urging Aaron to command the dragon, 
Raven is dismayed to find both Aaron and the dragon with closed eyes. Raven notes the sizable presence of the eagle monsters, who launch a coordinated attack on the white dragon, which remains passive. Shocked by the dragon's lack of response, Raven cries out in disbelief, demanding to know why it isn't defending itself. Turning to Aaron for answers, Raven is interrupted as more monsters emerge from the right side. Despite the dwindling numbers of monsters, Raven realizes there are still more than he anticipated. The situation becomes increasingly dire as their foes continue to multiply. Before Raven could react, the monsters launch an attack against both him and Aaron. Raven reflects on the unmatched might of dragons, believing their presence ensured victory. However, he chastises himself for relying on such fantasies and being overconfident. As Raven opens his eyes, he's shocked to witness the dragon being overwhelmed by the monsters. Confusion grips him as he struggles to comprehend the sudden turn of events. As the monster advances toward Raven, he rises despite his injuries and swiftly dispatches his assailants with the aid of his sword. Feeling utterly drained, Raven acknowledges his deep wounds, knowing they won't heal instantly. He gazes at the fallen white dragon and himself with disdain, recognizing their shared foolishness. Approaching the dragon, Raven queries if it's truly deceased, receiving no response. His attention then turns to the injured Aaron Pendragon lying nearby. Raven implores Aaron to clarify why the dragon ceased its attack upon Aaron's command. Frustrated, Raven insists that victory was within reach had the dragon continued fighting, pressing Aaron for an explanation. Unexpectedly, Raven is struck from behind, sending him crashing to the ground. To his astonishment, the assailant is revealed to be Balti. Raven is left reeling from the betrayal. Suddenly, Balti commands the soldiers to charge and put an end to the chaos. Raven is stunned to see Balti ordering the Imperial forces into action. Balti dismisses Raven's surprise, citing the reality that some individuals wield ultimate control from the outset, while others blindly adhere to their decisions. In a shocking turn of events, Balti swiftly dispatches Aaron Pendragon before Raven's eyes. Balti nonchalantly explains that Aaron's fate was predetermined, leaving Raven bewildered. Turning his attention to Raven, Balti acknowledges Raven's exceptional combat skills and reveals that Raven possesses an extraordinary healing ability. Raven is astonished by this revelation and questions Balti's knowledge about him. Balti admits to feigning ignorance until now, lamenting the unfortunate circumstance that Raven, despite his immortal body, will meet his end today. Raven is left grappling with the grim reality of his impending demise. Faced with the realization that freedom and the restoration of his family seem increasingly out of reach, Raven reflects on the singular purpose that has driven him for the past decade. Despite his unwavering determination, he begins to feel the weight of his powerlessness and vulnerability. Raven resigns himself to the grim fate that awaits him in this desolate place, lamenting the cruel reality of his situation. In a surprising gesture, Baltavi offers Raven a revelation in his final moments. He discloses a shocking truth. The downfall of the Vault family, Raven's forced enlistment in the Rakshasa units, and the impending demise of both Raven and Aaron Pendragon were all part of a meticulously orchestrated plan. Raven is stunned by this revelation, grappling with the implications of the manipulation that has shaped his fate. As Balti moves to execute Raven, the White Dragon, previously believed to be defeated, opens her eyes. With a solemn declaration that all conditions have been met, the White Dragon ascends into the sky. It proclaims that on this day, as the sun and moon converge, the pact will be fulfilled with the blood of a thousand men and monsters, a dragon monarch, and a human monarch. As the dragon's head begins to glow, it gazes into the heavens and declares that the outcome now rests upon the dragon rider. Raven finds himself in a bewildering situation, questioning if he's even alive after recalling a sensation of his body contorting unnaturally. As Raven gradually awakens, the maid assisting him is taken aback by a stirring. With a gasp, she hastily rushes outside to spread the news that the young lord has regained consciousness. Meanwhile, Raven surveys his surroundings, noting the opulent furnishings of the unfamiliar room. Puzzled, he wonders about his location and how he came to be there. Raven encounters a butler named Melbon, who bursts into tears at Raven's awakening. The butler addresses Raven as the young lord and asks if he recognizes him. Puzzled, Raven inquires about the title, Young Lord prompting the butler to reveal that they are in Conrad Castle, under the rule of Aaron Pendragon, whom Raven apparently now embodies. Raven is struck with disbelief upon hearing this revelation. Hastily, he seeks confirmation by catching sight of his reflection in the nearby water, where the truth dawns upon him, he has somehow transformed into Aaron Pendragon. The maid, Lindsay, 
inquires of young Lord Aaron whether he recalls his identity. The butler interjects, expressing little surprise at Aaron's confusion, given his three-year-long unconsciousness. Aaron is stunned by this revelation, realizing that three years have passed since the fateful battle. Inwardly, he recollects the moment when Balti took down Aaron, an event etched vividly in Raven's memory. The realization dawns on him as he grapples with the implications of assuming another's identity. Raven's mind swirls with confusion and disbelief. He questions his own mortality, pondering the inexplicable return of the supposedly deceased Pendragon. News of Aaron's awakening spread, drawing his mother, Lady Elena, to his side. Lindsay and the butler greeted Lady Elena with joy. As Elena walks towards Aaron, he's shocked to see her simply walk through the woman blocking her path. The woman signals to Aaron with a subtle gesture, indicating for him to keep her presence a secret. And Elena embraced her son, prompting a query about his memory of her. Aaron was utterly bewildered, unable to grasp the surreal events unfolding around him. Nothing seemed to align with logic or reason. Then, an elderly woman motioned towards the window, drawing Aaron's attention to the side outside. There, Amidst a flurry of gasps and startled murmurs, stood the majestic white dragon, Soldrake. Soldrake's thunderous roars reverberated through the room, sending shockwaves of disbelief through everyone present. As the dragon attempted to breach Aaron's chamber, Aaron couldn't fathom how he knew the creature's name. Soldrake was supposed to have perished alongside Aaron during that fateful incident. Pondering the possibility of the dragon's survival, Aaron's mind struggled to reconcile the inexplicable. His confusion deepened as his mother positioned herself protectively before him, confronting the dragon with an unwavering resolve. In a surprising turn, the elderly woman stepped forward, effortlessly taming Soldrake with gentle gestures. Witnessing this astonishing display, Aaron moved to intervene, but the old woman silenced him with a playful wink, leaving him to grapple with the enigma unfolding before his eyes. Aaron's astonishment deepened as Elena urged him to stay clear, cautioning of danger. Hearing his mother's words, Aaron realized he alone could perceive the presence of the mysterious old woman. With a few uttered words, the old woman commanded Soul Drake, prompting the dragon to soar away from the castle as she vanished into thin air. Witnessing her disappearance, Aaron felt a surge of surprise. Melbon, the butler, hurried to Elena's side, expressing concern for her well-being. Assured by Elena that she was unharmed, Elena turned to Aaron, her gaze fixing upon him, as she inquired about his well-being. Aaron. Amidst the opulent castle, surrounded by worried attendants and a departing white dragon, couldn't shake the feeling of inhabiting Aaron Pendragon's role. Elena's repeated inquiries about his welfare prompted Aaron to reassure her, calming both Elena and Melbon. Resolving to untangle the mysteries surrounding him, Aaron acknowledged the need to gather information discreetly. As Aaron endeavors to conceal his true identity as Raven from the servants, he resolves to gather pertinent information from them discreetly. Within the Empire, the Rakshasa unit stood as a marginalized and subpar unit, existing in a realm devoid of human rights. Yet, within this harsh environment, Raven managed to endure for a decade. His survival was a testament to his refined combat skills and extraordinary healing prowess. Raven emerged as a warrior without adversaries, feared by both humans and monsters alike. However, fate took a cruel turn during the monster eradication campaign in the Lobteen Plain. In the throes of battle, Raven, on the brink of liberation from the Rakshasa units, met his demise alongside Lord Pendragon, whom he had faithfully guarded. Supposedly fallen, Raven defied death, inhabiting Lord Pendragon's body. Moreover, he found himself transported back in time, seven years prior to the fatal confrontation. This extraordinary turn of events heralded a profound transformation for Raven. Shedding his former life of relentless monster hunting, he emerged as Aaron Pendragon. As Lindsay tended to him, feeding him with a tenderness reminiscent of infancy, Aaron couldn't help but feel a pang of discomfort. The transition from formidable warrior to being cared for like a child struck him as excessive. Aaron informed Lindsay that it had been several days since he woke up, emphasizing that he could manage to eat by himself. He requested the food from her. However, Lindsay explained that the doctor's instructions mandated absolute stillness for Aaron, requiring assistance from the maids during meals. She gently urged Aaron to comply by opening his mouth for her to feed him. Reflecting on Lindsay's devoted care during his slumber as Raven, Aaron acknowledged her overprotectiveness. Despite feeling embarrassed, Aaron yielded to her insistence, allowing her to feed him. After finishing his meal, Lindsay expressed her hope that Aaron enjoyed it and announced her intention to help him dress until his medication was ready. Aaron declined her offer, 
asserting his ability to dress himself. He instructed Lindsay to bring his clothes and a hair clip while he washed his face. Lindsay, I can manage, Aaron insisted, attempting to walk despite the protests about his frail body. However, Lindsay gently intervened, guiding him to a chair. She assured him she would handle changing his clothes and fixing his hair. Reluctantly, Aaron relented, allowing Lindsay to tend to him. As Lindsay tied his hair and helped him change, Aaron couldn't shake off the feeling of frustration at his current state, relying on others for even the simplest tasks. Suddenly, a voice called out, addressing him as brother. Startled, Aaron turned to see his sister, Lady Irene, accompanied by her daughter, Lady Mia. Mia rushed over to him, enveloping him in a hug, prompting an awkward smile from Aaron. Irene apologized for their unexpected visit and inquired about Aaron's ability to walk. Aaron reassured her, prompting Lindsay to offer Irene a seat. Despite Irene's concern about intruding, Aaron insisted they were not a bother. Irene's joy at his reassurance was evident as she mentioned the blooming summer flowers in the courtyard, steering the conversation towards lighter topics. As Aaron anticipated the chance to venture outside with Irene to admire the flowers, she eagerly launched into a detailed discourse about them. Aaron couldn't help but inwardly sigh, knowing he was in for another lengthy discussion. Despite his initial intention to feign amnesia upon waking up, Irene's loquacious nature made it nearly impossible to maintain the pretense. Yet, he found solace in the wealth of information she unwittingly provided. Listening to Irene's descriptions of the previous Aaron Pendragon, Aaron couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy. The image she painted was of a melancholy figure, more inclined towards reading and drawing than wielding a sword. Furthermore, he learned of Aaron's timid and shy demeanor, often retreating to his room. These traits had led to ridicule among the nobles, despite Aaron's noble lineage. It was no wonder the Pendragon family had fallen from grace. But now, having been reincarnated as Aaron, Raven saw an opportunity to alter the course of history. In his current form, Aaron inhabited the 17-year-old body he possessed before crossing paths with Raven on the battlefield. Within the castle walls, whispers circulated that Aaron had been comatose for nearly three years, from the age of 14. Raven pondered the curious twist of fate that had him awaken as Aaron in this particular circumstance. However, he dismissed the question of why as insignificant compared to the opportunity it presented. For Raven, the paramount concern was his continued existence and the chance to start anew, seven years prior. Freed from the shackles of the Rakshasa units, he aimed to redeem the tarnished honor of his family name, Vault. This rebirth offered him a second shot at fulfilling his unmet ambitions and unraveling the enigmatic words uttered by Balti before his demise, words hinting at a deeper connection between events. As Aaron Pintragon and Raven Vault intertwined, Raven resolved to embark once more into battle. Elena turns to Aaron, her voice drawing his attention as she asks if he's listening. Aaron offers a quick apology to his sister, urging her to continue. Irene then informs Aaron that it appears Luna will be visiting him soon. Perplexed, Aaron inquired about Luna's identity. Irene revealed Luna as the adopted daughter of Count Sirod, a knight of the Pendragon House. Irene reveals to Aaron that Luna is not only his visitor but also his fiancée. The revelation left Aaron momentarily speechless, grappling with the unexpected news. Meanwhile, outside, a carriage traversed through the forest, escorted by knights. Within, one of the knights informed Lady Luna of their imminent arrival at Conrad Castle, the seat of the Pendragon Duchy. Joseph Britton, the first knight of the Sirod Count family, approached Lady Luna with a question. He noted that she was about to meet her fiancé for the first time in three years and inquired about her feelings. Luna dismissed his concern, questioning why she should confide in him. She redirected his focus to his duties, indicating she didn't want him to worry about her. In her mind, Luna harbored doubts about Aaron Pendragon's strength. She believed Aaron to be weak and timid, doubting their ability to hold a proper conversation. Despite their engagement being initially beneficial for her family, Luna resolved to end it that day. Her father, the Count of Sirod, had decided to cancel the engagement due to the declining power of the Pendragon House. Luna disagreed with her father's leniency on the matter, feeling it was time to sever ties with a house that had fallen behind the others. Truthfully, Luna felt a wave of relief when her father instructed her to end things with Pendragon. Britton commented on Luna's facade of Luca's visit, knowing she was on her way to dissolve the engagement. He wondered if young Lord Aaron had matured, but Luna brushed off his inquiry asserting it was none of his concern. She cautioned Britain against needlessly antagonizing the Pendragon Knights, but Britain laughed it off, claiming there were no knights in Pendragon anymore. 
He doubted Aaron could reclaim past glory, especially after failing to make a pact with a dragon. Britain boasted that he could bring more honor to the Searod house than Pendragon ever could. Luna, annoyed by Britain's arrogance, asked him to step back, as Joseph's behavior had been unpleasant. Joseph, realizing his mistake, apologized to Lady Luna. Luna pondered the lack of decent men in both the Pendragon and Searod families, finding fault in both weakness and arrogance. As they gathered in the entrance hall of Conrad Castle, Luna exchanged greetings with Aaron, his mother, and sister. Irene complimented Luna's appearance, while Elena expressed gratitude for her visit. Elena then entrusted Aaron with the task of escorting Luna to her room. Observing Aaron, Luna couldn't help but feel a sense of disappointment. Despite his age, he seemed incapable of even basic social interactions without being prodded. However, with a sudden display of charm, Aaron greeted Luna and offered to show her to her room. Luna was taken aback by this unexpected shift in demeanor. Aaron, noticing Luna's surprise, suggested she stay in a separate room from the knights. Luna found herself speechless, grappling with her conflicting emotions upon witnessing Aaron's uncharacteristic behavior. Gathering her composure, Luna apologized to Aaron for her earlier behavior and requested that he assign the knight to a separate room. Witnessing Luna's composed demeanor, Aaron reflected on Irene's description of Luna as calm and reserved, contrasting it with her current attitude towards him after three years of separation. He realized the political nature of their marriage. Led by Lindsay, Aaron and Luna were shown to their room. As they entered, Lindsay offered to prepare tea, receiving Aaron's approval. Aaron then urged Luna to sit down, surprising her with his assertiveness. Luna struggled to comprehend Aaron's sudden transformation from someone who couldn't even make eye contact to one confidently interacting with her and the servants. Commenting on Aaron's change, Luna mentioned hearing about his memory loss and questioned if he had forgotten about her. Aaron confirmed this, explaining that upon awakening, he couldn't recall anything from his past. He expressed regret for this, apologizing to Luna. Luna observed that Aaron had transformed into a completely different person after losing his memory, yet she couldn't help but notice how strikingly handsome he had become. She believed that with Aaron's newfound confidence, even the declining Pendragon family could potentially revive. Meanwhile, Aaron contemplated the precarious situation between the Pendragon and neighboring families, lacking crucial information about potential consequences. He sensed that Luna was concealing something from their initial encounter and resolved to uncover it. Aaron acknowledged the remarks from his servants and sister about his changed demeanor, implying that if Luna disapproved, she should discuss it with Count Sirot. In response, Luna vehemently rejected the suggestion, indicating that she held no desire to involve her father. The tension between them simmered as Luna's outburst hinted at deeper complexities beneath the surface. Luna swiftly apologized to Aaron for her sudden outburst, feeling conflicted about the situation. She recognized that her father had already decided to end the engagement with Aaron and had come to discuss it that day. Despite acknowledging Aaron's personal growth, Luna remained convinced that he couldn't restore the Pendragon family's reputation. Therefore, she felt compelled to address the matter with him promptly. As Luna prepared to broach the subject, Lindsay interrupted with a message from the Duchess, summoning Aaron and Lady Searod to the audience chamber immediately. Aaron inquired about the urgency, prompting Lindsay to reveal that a commotion caused by the knight accompanying Luna had occurred. Luna was taken aback by the unforeseen development, realizing the timing couldn't be worse. Feeling cornered, Luna struggled to articulate her intentions to Aaron before the interruption. Aaron, sensing her discomfort, remarked that Luna appeared to have been concealing something since her arrival. Aaron asked Luna if she came with bad intentions today. Luna reassured Aaron that she didn't have any ill will. Though she disliked Aaron, Luna felt it was necessary to tell him something important. Aaron then left, promising to hear her out later, suggesting they first deal with Luna's night. Luna was puzzled by Aaron's sudden change but decided to focus on stopping Britain for now. Eventually, Luna agreed to accompany Aaron. The scene transitions to the grandeur of the audience hall, where the butler, with a hint of curiosity, inquires of Britain whether Count Searod has indeed agreed to dissolve the engagement. Britain affirms this, elaborating that both Luna and himself have arrived to deliver this news to young Lord Aaron. Selena's frustration becomes palpable as she absorbs this revelation, and she confronts Britain, her voice tinged with a mix of incredulity and indignation. She points out the implication of Count Sirod's actions, suggesting that his willingness to end the engagement signifies his readiness to accept accountability for the fallout. 
Britain acknowledges her astute observation and reveals that Count Seerod seeks to make amends by offering the Pendragon family ownership of lucrative gold and crystal mines near the border, as well as two prized lumber mills in the Brynyard Forest. The enormity of this proposal visibly startles both Selina and Melbon, their expressions betraying a mixture of astonishment and disbelief. With a calculated tone, Britain then subtly suggests to Selina that given her current shortage of household staff and knights, it might be prudent to consider Count Sirod's generous offer. Selina, her pride wounded by Britain's insinuations, silently wonders just how much further he intends to slight the honor of the Pendragon lineage. Selina acknowledges the challenging economic situation facing the Pendragon family, but resolves not to accept the offer, driven by pride in her family name. Firmly, she informs Britain of her decision to decline the proposal. Britain, however, questions Selina's certainty, highlighting the potential opportunity it presents to restore their family's fortunes. Selina's frustration mounts at his persistence. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifts as the knights enter, paying their respects, followed by Aaron Pendragon. Selina and Melbourne's spirits lift at Aaron's arrival. Britain sees Aaron's presence as a significant moment. He believes Luna should take note, as he intends to demonstrate his superiority to Aaron. As Aaron assumes his seat, Britain approaches him, only to be met with Aaron's confusion. Aaron reveals he has lost his memories and doesn't recognize Britain. Shocked, Britain reassesses the situation, realizing Aaron's altered state doesn't necessarily diminish his capabilities. Britain is determined to demonstrate to Aaron the disparity between them and intends to adjust Aaron's attitude. Stepping forward, Britain begins to assert his status as the top knight of the Sirod Count House, but Aaron abruptly interrupts, ordering him to step back. Britain is taken aback by this command. Aaron dismisses Britain, expressing no interest in him and deeming him just a mere knight. Britain, feeling slighted, questions Aaron's rudeness. However, Aaron counters with a stern assertion that it's Britain's party who has come to his castle with disrespect. With an intense gaze, Aaron reiterates his demand for Britain to step back, leaving Britain shocked into compliance. Turning to Luna, Aaron remarks on the commotion and his discovery of the argument over a mere breakup upon his arrival. Aaron gestures for Luna Searod to step forward, suggesting they continue their conversation themselves. Luna is caught off guard by the turn of events and ponders her next move. Aaron addresses Luna, affirming that Searod intends to end the engagement and compensate the Pendragon family with a gold mine, a crystal mine, and two lumber mills. He suggests this should settle the matter. Luna, Selena, and Melbon are taken aback by Aaron's blunt approach. Selena questions where Aaron learned such assertiveness, while Melbon advises caution before making any decisions. Aaron acknowledges Searod's actions but emphasizes the need for the Pendragons to focus on reclaiming their strength. He dismisses the significance of the marriage dispute, expressing doubt that the Pendragons can sway Searod's decision. Aaron questions Luna if he's mistaken. Luna internally grapples with the realization that she must inform Aaron of her inability to marry him. Reluctantly, she admits to herself that she's beginning to fall in love with Aaron Pendragon. Aaron notices Luna's hesitation and suggests that if it's a decision from the Searod household, Luna's personal thoughts need not factor in. He accepts the end of the engagement with Searod without giving Luna a chance to speak. Aaron then turns to Duchess Selina for her approval, which she grants, expressing her trust in Aaron as the head of the Pendragon family. With Selina's consent, Aaron formally announces the annulment of the marriage between himself and Luna Searod. Luna and Britain are frustrated, while Selina and Melbon feel relieved. In a moment of solitude, Aaron reflects on the mounting pressures and declares his desire to be excluded from any further marriage discussions. Aaron reflects on his decision to inquire about the economic state of Pendragon territory from Irene. He reasons that if breaking the engagement can yield such significant resources, particularly the valuable crystal mine essential for magical materials, there's little reason to decline. Securing the crystal mine could enable Pendragon to attract skilled mages to their domain, enhancing their capabilities. As Aaron strolls through the corridor, he notices a portrait of the elderly woman he encountered earlier in his room. Curious, he approaches Lindsay and inquires about the woman's identity. Lindsay informs Aaron that she is Lady Atia Pendragon, the older sister of Aaron's grandfather, Sir Klein Pendragon. Aaron repeats her name, only for Atia Pendragon herself to speak from behind him, commending Aaron for addressing her by her name. Startled by her sudden appearance, Aaron listens as Atia expresses her desire to speak with him privately, inviting him to engage in a conversation. Aaron approached Lady Atia with a puzzled expression, 
wondering why she sought his audience. She met his gaze with a solemn air before revealing the truth. She was a ghost, and to communicate with the living, her name had to be invoked. Aaron found himself at a loss, contemplating the surreal encounter. Despite facing monsters for a decade, conversing with a spirit was an entirely new experience for him. He couldn't help but reflect on the strange occurrences since he awoke in this unfamiliar body. With a grave demeanor, Lady Atia wasted no time delving into the matter at hand. Her piercing gaze bore into Aaron as she questioned his identity, knowing full well he wasn't Aaron Pendragon. Shock washed over Aaron upon hearing her assertion. Sensing his disbelief, Lady Atia quickly softened her tone, offering apologies for the blunt delivery that may have seemed threatening. She explained that her knowledge came from Soldrake, who had informed her of Aaron's true nature. Understanding dawned upon Aaron as he pieced together the puzzle before him. With newfound clarity, he inquired if Lady Atia could communicate with dragons as well, and whether she knew his original identity. Lady Atia admitted to Aaron that she didn't possess that knowledge and expressed a desire to understand what transpired. Aaron pondered the situation, realizing Atia's spectral nature and contemplating the exclusivity of their interaction. If he was the sole witness to Atia's presence, perhaps she could become an ally in his journey. Assured of his decision, Aaron vowed to disclose everything despite his doubts about Atia's willingness to believe him. He embarked on a narrative, revealing not only the events leading to his current state, but also his true identity as Raven Vault. Aaron recounted the fateful day on the Lobteen Plain, where both Aaron and Raven perished, or so it was believed. Aaron grappled with the mystery of why Raven awoke in the guise of Aaron Pendragon after supposedly dying. As Aaron shared his tale, Atia began to grasp the essence of his being. Aaron was taken aback by her acceptance of his extraordinary story. Atia reassured him, explaining that belief was irrelevant in the face of his tangible presence. Soldrake, too, had recognized the anomaly of Aaron's existence, further validating his truth. Atia found herself inclined to believe Aaron's account, but she dropped a bombshell that left him reeling. She suggested that the Aaron Raven had protected on the Lobstein Plain might have been an imposter. Shock washed over Aaron at the implications of such a revelation. With a solemn tone, Atia delved into the intricate history of the Pendragon lineage. She spoke of generations of heirs forming pacts with Soldrake, weaving a tapestry of power and obligation. Then she posed a question to Raven. Had he ever heard of the necessity to unlock a mausoleum? Atia elaborated, revealing the true significance of the Pendragon Mausoleum. It wasn't merely a resting place for ancestral souls, but a repository of the family's fortune, ancestral blessings, and the familiars of Soldrake. Within its depths lay a magic tower housing the closely guarded secrets of the Pendragon lineage, the wellspring of their greatness. The opening of the mausoleum symbolized stability and prosperity for the Pendragon family, while its closure heralded decline. Atia emphasized the gravity of the situation, explaining that only the heirs of Pendragon possessed the key to unlock the mausoleum gate. Atia elucidated the daunting challenge of forming a pact with Soldrake, whose authority was nearly insurmountable. The Pendragon heir had but a single opportunity to forge this pact. Failure meant relinquishing the task to future generations. Even renowned figures like Klein and his predecessor Gordon had struggled with the pact, highlighting its formidable nature. Aaron, deemed the weakest Pendragon in history, had been decisively defeated by Soldrake, plunging him into a coma. Atia explained the grim reality that heirs defeated by Soldrake seldom regained consciousness. The noble white dragon only submitted to those who conquered her authority making Aaron's chances of departing with Soldrake to encounter Raven Vault seem improbable. Aaron absorbed this revelation with shock. However, Atia swiftly redirected the focus, assuring Aaron that his identity was currently inconsequential. Instead, she emphasized the paramount importance of Aaron Pendragon awakening with another soul within him. Aaron queried Atia about the cryptic message she was conveying. In response, Atia revealed that while the body belonged to Aaron, the soul within did not. This revelation meant there was still a chance to forge a pact with Soldrake if the soul was different. Atia then outlined a daring plan for Raven. She explained that the Pendragon forces were currently insufficient, 
Raven was to journey to the treacherous Ancona Forest, a haven for ferocious monsters. Battling through the ceaseless onslaught, Raven would ultimately reach the heart of the forest, the Pendragon Mausoleum. There, he would showcase his strength and forge a pact with Soldrake, the guardian of the mausoleum. Atia urged Raven to embrace his destiny as the true heir of Pendragon and undertake the mission. With a probing gaze, she asked for his thoughts on the matter, questioning whether he believed he could succeed. Raven, resolute, agreed to the task. He cited his familiarity with battling monsters and expressed optimism about the potential benefits of opening the mausoleum. With Raven's commitment sealed, Atia nodded in approval, reassured by his determination. She emphasized the importance of this quest and the potential rewards it held for both Raven and the Pendragon lineage. Furthermore, Atia pointed out that it would benefit Raven personally if the Pendragon name regained its authority. With his own ambitions in mind, Raven pledged to utilize all available resources. Atia observed Raven's decisive nature and admired his determination, feeling a sense of affinity towards him. She assured Raven that she harbored no objections to his goals and expressed her desire for Pendragon to reclaim its former glory, which aligned with her own wishes. Atia promised not to hinder Raven's pursuits. Raven expressed gratitude for her understanding. With clarity on the next steps, Raven acknowledged the need to assert control over the vassals. Despite the support the family received after Aaron's coma, Raven acknowledged the lingering disdain he faced due to his predecessor's actions. Atia acknowledged Raven's assessment, recognizing that some still underestimated the current head of Pendragon and the family's fortunes. Atia instructed Raven to identify the loyal vassals and assert his authority as the head of the castle. Raven acknowledged the task at hand, recognizing the need to take command of the vassals and prepare for the impending battle to open the mausoleum. With determination in his voice, Raven stated that he would have everything under control within half a month, resorting to force if necessary. The scene transitions to the exterior, where Aaron is deeply engrossed in his training regimen. Aaron strives to recapture the sensations he experienced as Raven while hunting monsters, their formidable size, their numbers, and their predatory behavior. He resolves not to rely on his comrades as mere fighters, but to hunt with the intent of single-handedly vanquishing them all, determined to prevent the tragedies of his past life from recurring. Linda, observing Aaron's intense training, is taken aback by his dedication. She admires his prowess, expressing her genuine astonishment at his abilities. Aaron reflects on the transformation his body has undergone since Raven's consciousness inhabited it. From initially being too feeble to wield a sword, Aaron's relentless workout routine has rendered his physique akin to that of Raven during his time in the Rakshasa unit. Unbeknownst to Raven, his healing and combat prowess have seamlessly transferred to Aaron, a remarkable phenomenon that Aaron is deeply grateful for. Just then, Mark Killian, a knight of the Pendragon House, approaches Aaron. Offering to spar with swords, Killian extends an invitation for Aaron to hone his skills further. Aaron contemplated Killian's offer to train him, but instead, he declined for the time being, explaining that he had something else in store for Killian later. The scene then shifted to the main hall of Conrad Castle, where a gathering had convened. Aaron, addressing everyone present, declared his intention to soon open the mausoleum. The announcement shocked Killian, the butler, and the soldiers. Killian voiced his concerns, stating that if Aaron wished to open the mausoleum, he would have to conquer the Ancona forest with only the current troop strength. With all due respect, Killian expressed doubt about Aaron's ability to lead in battle, given his limited training thus far. Aaron, however, urged Killian to set aside his reservations momentarily and provide insight into the situation at the gate. Killian described a scene of absolute chaos, where monsters and bandits roamed freely. He explained that vigilante groups had formed in each town to combat the escalating threat. As tension thickened in the room, Aaron acknowledged Killian's grim assessment of the situation. Monsters and bandits loomed ever closer to the gate, threatening to breach the castle's defenses. Despite the peril, Aaron remained resolute declaring that Pendragon would not relinquish their hold on the gate. The butler, however, urged caution, proposing a strategy that involved bolstering the family's power through the crystal mines bestowed by the Sirods. 
He suggested that Aaron undergo tactical training with Sir Killian before proceeding further. But Aaron countered, pointing out the harsh reality. Pendragon lacked the manpower to protect the crystal mines, let alone operate them effectively. He emphasized that time was of the essence, and delaying action was not an option. In a decisive move, Aaron announced that they would depart in 15 days, with him personally leading the operation. He made it clear that objections would not be tolerated. Killian's laughter at Aaron's proclamation drew Aaron's scrutiny. With a hint of defiance, Aaron challenged Killian, questioning the humor in entrusting him with command. Descending the stairs with determination etched on his face, Aaron voiced his frustration at the incessant opposition he faced. Addressing Killian, he challenged him to a duel, citing Killian's repeated assertions of wanting to restrain him. Aaron declared that he had prepared a grand stage for Killian. Killian, taken aback, questioned Aaron's resolve, expressing doubt about his ability to survive on the front line without training. Aaron brushed aside Killian's concerns, accusing him of verbosity and urging him to let his sword do the talking. Drawing his sword, Aaron charged at Killian, who managed to parry the attack but felt the weight behind Aaron's strike. In retaliation, Killian launched a counterattack, only for Aaron to deftly evade it. Seizing an opportunity, Aaron leaped into the air, unleashing a powerful strike. Despite Killian's own counterstrike, he asserted his superiority, refusing to be bested by a novice in swordsmanship. As Aaron withdrew from his strike, Killian, interpreting it as a sign of surrender, but in a swift and unexpected move, Aaron used the cover of his sword to deliver a decisive blow to Killian's chest, sending him crashing to the ground. Shock rippled through the onlookers at the sudden turn of events. Turning to address the assembled soldiers, Aaron reiterated his earlier declaration. They would depart in 15 days, and he would forge a pact with the White Dragon to open the mausoleum. Any objections were to be voiced now. In response, the soldiers unanimously pledged their allegiance to Aaron's command. Meanwhile, in the guest room of Conrad Castle, Luna remained. Britain entered, questioning Luna's decision to stay in Pendragon's territory. Luna asserted her intention to accompany young Lord Aaron to the battlefield. Britain, puzzled, queried Luna's motives, citing the broken engagement and Aaron's perceived ineptitude in battle despite his apparent transformation. In response to Britain's suggestion that Lady Luna should swiftly return to Sirod territory under his escort as a skilled knight, Luna sharply rebuked his condescending attitude. She expressed her disdain for Britain's constant arrogance and belittlement of others, highlighting his apparent unawareness of her reasons for remaining at the castle. Luna explained that the Pendragons were relatives of the Sirod family, being one of the five ducal houses of the empire and bearing the bloodline of the emperor. Despite the broken engagement, Luna emphasized the importance of gathering information on the Pendragon's actions to assess potential losses and gains for the Sirod House. She asserted that it would be unwise to hastily return to Sirod territory, especially when young Lord Aaron embarked on his journey to the front. Luna declared her intention to accompany Aaron, ensuring she remained abreast of developments. Britain conceded to Luna's reasoning, agreeing to accompany them only as far as the Bellant Gate. Britain pressed Luna to promise that after reaching the Bellant Gate, she would return home with him. Luna assented, reassuring Britain that she would honor her word. However, in her thoughts, Luna pondered the significance of Aaron's transformation. She believed that if Aaron succeeded in opening the mausoleum with his newfound strength, the Pendragon House would undoubtedly reclaim its former glory. Luna resolved to witness firsthand just how formidable Aaron had become. Meanwhile, Britain seethed with resentment over Aaron's perceived humiliation of him. He harbored a deep desire to demonstrate to Aaron the harsh realities of the outside world once they departed. The scene transitions to 15 days later, where all the assembled forces stand outside the castle, prepared to depart. Aaron's mother, Selina, embraces him tightly, urging him to promise his safe return. Aaron reassures her, pledging to secure the white dragon and the mausoleum before returning home unharmed. He then turns to see Irene and Mia shedding tears. With comforting words, Aaron assures them of his safe return. Lindsay approaches Aaron, signaling that it's time to leave. Aaron mounts his horse, ready to embark on the journey. Just as he prepares to depart, 
The butler arrives, presenting Aaron with Pendragon's revered sword, the window scream. As Aaron accepts the sword, he reflects on the significance of the upcoming battle. He is determined to reclaim Pendragon's power and fulfill the long-awaited wish of the vault house that he couldn't fulfill in the past. With the treasured sword in hand, Aaron is resolved to restore the honor lost by the Raven family and erase the stigma of their betrayal against the Empire. With determination coursing through him, Aaron readied himself for the impending battle. As he raised his sword, he rallied his troops, urging them to fight for the glory of Pendragon. The soldiers surged forward, confronting the monstrous wolves that lurked within the forest. Killian cautioned Aaron to be careful, but Aaron assured him that he could handle the creatures. With a single swift strike, Aaron dispatched the monsters, instilling confidence in his troops. He urged them to press onward without hesitation. Killian, Lindsay, and Luna watched in awe as Aaron displayed his prowess. Upon reaching the Bellant Gate, Aaron halted his troops and instructed Killian to remain outside while he assessed the situation within. Killian ordered the soldiers to rest until further notice. Approaching Aaron, Lindsay offered him water, her face smeared with dust. Concerned for her well-being, Aaron suggested she take a break and wash her face. Blushing, Lindsay protested, claiming she couldn't possibly do so. Aaron insisted to Lindsay that it was an order, reassuring her that she need not worry about him. He urged her to rest, emphasizing that it was equally important for her well-being. Lindsay acquiesced, agreeing to follow Aaron's directive. Entering the Bellant Gate, Aaron surveyed the scene with disappointment. The state of disrepair exceeded his expectations. There were insufficient personnel and resources to maintain the fortress. Even the soldiers' equipment was worn out, leaving Aaron to lament that even the Rakshasa unit might have been better equipped. Recognizing the importance of the Bellant Gate and Pendragon territory, Aaron was dismayed by the incompetence of its commander and knights. He turned to Killian for answers, inquiring about the whereabouts of the gate's leadership. Killian revealed that the knights had deserted, taking the soldiers with them. Shocked by this revelation, Aaron's frustration grew. Determined to rectify the situation, Aaron informed Killian of his intention to pursue the deserters the following day. Aaron wasted no time in issuing orders to Killian, instructing him to prepare everyone without delay. His resolve hardened, Aaron vowed to confront those soldiers who dared to underestimate Pendragon's authority. The scene shifted to the Southstone Forest within Pendragon territory, where an abandoned monastery served as the rendezvous point for the bandits. Among them, word spread like wildfire that Aaron Pendragon had awakened. With determination gleaming in their eyes, the bandits resolved to deal with Aaron Pendragon themselves. The scene transitions to Aaron Pendragon's private quarters within the Bellant Gate. Aaron addresses Killian and the others, expressing his intention to depart ahead of the Pendragon forces the next day, with Killian and the troops following behind. Killian raises a concern about leaving the gate short of commanders and soldiers for defense. Britain interjects, assuring Killian that the Sirod House will provide soldiers to compensate for their absence. This, he explains, is how Sirod will reciprocate Pendragon's hospitality during their stay at Conrad Castle. Britain also pledges his personal assistance to young Lord Aaron as a token of gratitude. Aaron, however, remains wary of Britain's motives uncertain of his true intentions. Despite his reservations, Aaron decides to temporarily allow Britain's involvement, recognizing the potential benefits of utilizing Sirod's resources. Acknowledging Killian's potential discontent with leaving the gate under another family supervision, Aaron assures him that their priority is to ensure the success of their mission. Killian reassured Aaron, acknowledging that the current circumstances prioritize practicality over appearances. He explained that the bandit leader, Del Jeffrey, had taken over 20 soldiers when he deserted, likely gaining more followers since. In Killian's view, the larger Pendragon's forces, the better their chances. Aaron expressed gratitude for Killian's swift comprehension. Curious to learn more about Del Jeffrey, Aaron urged Killian to elaborate. Killian described Del Jeffrey as a skilled swordsman, but noted his arrogance. He recounted how, upon Aaron's incapacitation, Del Jeffrey had brazenly demanded the title of baron and control over three villages near the gate. When the Duchess promptly refused, their relationship soured. 
leading to Del Jeffrey's desertion, now a bandit controlling the area around the village of Southstone. Hearing this, Aaron concluded that Del Jeffrey was not unintelligent. He surmised that it was more efficient and strategic for Del Jeffrey to expand his power by attacking villages outside rather than directly occupying the gate. Aaron contemplated that he might have made similar choices in Del Jeffrey's position. Killian further informed Aaron that the village of Southstone lay in ruins, warning that without immediate action from Pendragon, the bandits might attempt to seize the gate. Upon hearing this, Aaron decided to orchestrate the entire operation, but to entrust Killian with its command. Killian was taken aback by Aaron's decision. Aaron explained that the men who had followed Killian in Aaron's absence would be more inclined to follow his orders due to their established rapport, whereas they had yet to build a relationship with Aaron. Aaron assured Killian of his trust and reliance on him. Grateful for the vote of confidence, Killian promised to handle the responsibility. Aaron then designated Killian to command the troops, with Britain serving as liaison officer and cavalryman. With plans set, Aaron instructed both of them to rest, as they would depart the following day. As Killian turned to leave, Aaron halted him. With Aaron offered a sincere apology to Killian for their previous encounter. Killian reassured Aaron, expressing gratitude for his concern and assuring him that he had not been injured. He thanked Aaron for his thoughtfulness. Aaron then conveyed his anticipation of continuing to have Killian serve as a Knight of Pendragon. With their exchange concluded, Killian departed, leaving Aaron to reflect. The scene transitioned to the Southstone village, where a soldier informed Jeffrey that they had exhausted the available resources in the area. Contemplating their next move, Jeffrey considered the possibility of taking down the gate soon, envisioning a future where Pendragon would inevitably fall under his control. Meanwhile, Aaron and the Pendragon forces arrived at the Southstone village. Surveying the dilapidated state of the village, Aaron noted its dire condition, worse than he had expected. Turning to Killian, Aaron inquired whether the rest of Pendragon's territory faced similar challenges. Killian confirmed Aaron's suspicions, revealing that 70% of Pendragon's total territory shared the same plight. Killian explained that while there were a few villages managing to hold their own, Attempting to seek help from the gate often resulted in encounters with bandits and monsters, placing them in perilous situations. Aaron realized that while he had been focused on reclaiming the mausoleum, he also needed to address the challenges faced by the Pendragon territory as a whole. Suddenly, a rustling from above caught their attention. Aaron immediately alerted everyone to stay vigilant. A monstrous creature descended from the trees. Recognizing it as a harpy, Aaron noted that its appearance couldn't have come at a more opportune moment. Aaron swung his sword at the bird monster, but it deftly evaded his attack. He swiftly instructed his five arbalests to step forward, commanding them to capture the harpy without causing harm. With precision, the arbalests managed to pin down the harpy as instructed. Killian remarked on the monster's increasing boldness in encroaching upon human villages. Suddenly, goblins emerged from the bushes, launching an attack on Aaron. However, Aaron effortlessly dispatched the goblins, leaving both the harpy and the defeated goblins at his feet. Killian suggested dealing with the monsters, but Aaron had a different plan. He declared that both the harpy and the goblins would be joining their ranks. Shocked by this decision, Killian and the soldiers questioned Aaron's rationale. Aaron explained that goblins possessed keen eyesight, while harpies were known for their speed, making them valuable allies. He saw them as useful familiars to aid in their mission. Killian expressed disbelief, having never heard of someone using monsters as familiars before. Aaron reminisced about how Killian had witnessed something similar on a battlefield long ago, though Killian seemed perplexed by Aaron's remark. Aaron clarified that he had come across this concept in a book. If he could utilize monsters or any other resource, he would. With a confident smile, Aaron urged Killian to observe. Approaching the goblins, Aaron inquired about their presence in human territory beyond the forest. The goblin, identifying himself as Kazal, explained that besides Aaron's group, many menacing creatures such as wolves, ghouls, harpies, orcs, and even a white dragon, had encroached upon their hunting grounds, forcing them to seek refuge in human territory. Understanding Kazal's predicament, Aaron turned to the harpy named Tada. With a firm gaze, 
Aaron questioned Tata if he had ever harmed a human. Startled, Tata admitted to never having done so. Drawing his sword, Aaron declared to both Tata and Kazal that they would now be under his command. As the lord of the land, Duke Pendragon, Aaron made it clear to Tata and Kazal that disobedience or attempted escape would result in facing the wrath of the white dragon. Both Tata and Kazal trembled at the thought and quickly pledged their obedience to Aaron's commands. Satisfied with their response, Aaron asserted his authority, informing them that they now served under him. Their first task was to lead Aaron to the South Stone village via the shortest route. Behind them, Killian and the soldiers watched in astonishment at Aaron's ability to command the monsters. Killian acknowledged Aaron's unconventional approach and resourcefulness, recognizing that there was much to learn from his methods. Aaron couldn't help but smile at the compliment. The scene shifted to the village where Kazal had successfully guided Aaron and the troops. Aaron instructed Killian to remain behind while he and Britain, accompanied by a few soldiers, would launch an attack on the abandoned monastery. Aaron decided to dispatch a messenger later to inform Killian and the soldiers that they could join him afterward. Killian nodded in understanding. Meanwhile, Luna pondered her lack of battlefield experience despite being under young Lord Aaron's protection, wondering if she would be able to handle it. Britain reassured Luna, promising to protect her. Aaron ordered the first group to depart, instructing Kazal and Tata to conduct a reconnaissance mission from the sky. As Aaron pressed forward, they encountered Jeffrey and his soldiers escorting villagers to the abandoned monastery. Just as Jeffrey was about to strike a young villager, Aaron intervened, swiftly incapacitating Jeffrey. Astonished to see Aaron Pendragon in Southstone Village, Jeffrey questioned how the once timid kid had ended up there. Before Jeffrey could say more, Aaron silenced him with a firm command. As Jeffrey attempted to speak, Aaron sternly indicated that he would allow him to talk when he deemed it appropriate. However, instead of engaging in dialogue, Jeffrey swiftly dashed to the other side, commanding his soldiers to attack. Responding with precision and swiftness, Aaron effortlessly incapacitated the assailants, leaving Jeffrey astonished by his prowess. Before Aaron could confront Jeffrey directly, Britain intervened, intercepting Aaron's strike aimed at Jeffrey. Luna and the other soldiers watched in disbelief as Britain stepped in. Britain offered assistance to Jeffrey who inquired about Britain's identity. Britain revealed himself as the first knight of the Order of the Red Moon from the Sirod Count House. He expressed his willingness to aid Geoffrey in his attempt to take down Aaron Pendragon. Observing this exchange, Luna questioned Britain's motives. Britain reassured Luna, implying that he was more suitable for her than Aaron. Ignoring Luna's concern, Britain and Geoffrey launched a coordinated attack against Aaron. Concerned for Aaron's safety, Luna urged him to step away from the confrontation. However, Aaron proved his capability by effortlessly blocking both Britain and Jeffrey's attacks, subsequently pushing them back. Turning to Luna, Aaron instructed her to move to a safer location, assuring her that he would swiftly deal with the knights. As Kazal escorted Luna to safety, she couldn't help but worry about Aaron facing formidable opponents like Britain and the bandit leader alone. Despite her concern, Luna found herself blushing as she watched Aaron's display of strength. Aaron then commanded Tata to fetch Killian, prompting Tata to rush off to fulfill the task. Britain and Jeffrey warned Aaron that even with reinforcements, they would defeat him before help arrived. Unfazed, Aaron chuckled and invited them to attack him together. Confident in his abilities, both Jeffrey and Britain launched a joint attack on Aaron. As Britain lunged forward, Aaron skillfully evaded his strike and managed to shatter Britain's sword with ease. Swiftly maneuvering behind Britain, Aaron swiftly incapacitated both Britain and Geoffrey with a single decisive blow, leaving them astonished. Addressing them calmly, Aaron remarked that their conventional swordsmanship was no match for him. Turning his attention to Britain, Aaron swiftly disarmed him, leaving Britain stunned. Aaron instructed Britain to cease lying on the ground and fulfill his duty of escorting Luna back to her territory. He warned Britain to leave Pendragon territory immediately and never return. Terrified, Britain scrambled away, fleeing towards safety. Aaron then turned to Jeffrey, who questioned if Aaron had made a pact with a demon. Jeffrey warned Aaron about the numerous bandits still inside the mansion, 
expressing doubt in Aaron's ability to face them alone. Aaron addressed Jeffrey firmly, questioning if he had forgotten about Pendragon's exceptional soldiers. He declared that his task was complete, and from that point forward, it would be his outstanding soldiers who would deal with the remnants. As if on cue, Killian arrived with the Pendragon forces, standing behind Aaron. Aaron warned that those who had betrayed Pendragon could expect no leniency in their punishment. After neutralizing the bandits, the scene shifted outside where the villagers expressed their gratitude to Aaron for saving them. Aaron assured them they could freely reach out if they needed assistance with reconstruction efforts. Delighted, the villagers thanked Aaron for his aid, their cheers filling the air as he departed from the village. As Aaron left, Kazal and Tata approached him, requesting a reward for their assistance. Aaron promised them a fitting reward once they returned to the campsite, prompting smiles from both creatures. Meanwhile, Killian informed Aaron that the Southstone village seemed to be managing well for the time being. However, Aaron disagreed, stating that there was still one more task to complete before they could conquer the Ancona forest. The scene unfolded several days prior within the walls of Conrad Castle. Lady Atiyah approached Aaron with a proposition that caught him off guard. She spoke of forging an alliance with the Ancona orcs, a notion that stirred surprise within Aaron's heart. Lady Atia elucidated the unique circumstance surrounding these orcs, dwelling within the confines of Pendragon territory under a solemn vow never to stray from the Ancona forest. She painted a vivid picture of their prowess in battle, their fighting abilities purportedly surpassing that of their brethren by twofold. Aaron listened intently as Lady Atia outlined how these formidable warriors could become invaluable assets in his forthcoming assault on the forest. Voicing his concern, Aaron remarked on the notorious thirst for battle that consumed the Orsish nature. Yet, Lady Atia remained steadfast in her conviction that they could be swayed to Aaron's cause. She made it clear that the outcome rested squarely upon Aaron's skills as a leader. In a somber moment of reflection, Lady Atia acknowledged the hierarchy that governed the orc's allegiance. A being of superior strength, such as the dragon Soldrake, held sway over them. However, the complexities of their situation dictated that Pendragon could not leverage Soldrake's power in this instance. Moreover, Lady Atia highlighted the challenge posed by Aaron's own history with Soldrake, a defeat that the Ancona orcs were undoubtedly aware of. To gain their allegiance, Aaron would need to prove himself in combat against these formidable warriors and emerge victorious. Lady Atia inquired of Aaron's past encounters with orcs, probing into his experiences before their present conversation. Aaron recollected a skirmish with a lone orc shortly after joining the Rakshasa unit, reminiscing about the struggles he faced in overcoming the creature. However, he asserted confidently that he had since honed his skills to handle such adversaries with greater ease. Upon hearing Aaron's assurance, Lady Atia's expression lit up with approval. She saw an opportunity in Aaron's capabilities and wasted no time in formulating a plan. Urging him to seize the moment, she instructed Aaron to challenge the Ancona orcs, swiftly defeat them, and thereby pave the way for her to access the mausoleum. In the present, Aaron relayed his intentions to Killian, disclosing his plans to forge an alliance with the Ancona orcs under Pendragon's banner. Killian's reaction was one of disbelief, visibly taken aback by the audacity of such a proposition. Aaron justified his decision by highlighting the strategic advantage of bolstering Pendragon's forces with the strength of the Orsish warriors. However, Killian voiced his concerns, cautioning Aaron about the potential consequences of engaging in battle with the formidable Orsish forces. He warned of the considerable risk involved, fearing that Pendragon's troops might suffer substantial losses if pitted against the orcs in combat. Tata and Kazal voiced their apprehensions to Aaron, cautioning him about the inherent dangers posed by the formidable strength of the orcs. Undeterred, Aaron rebuked their defeatist attitude, asserting his disdain for surrender without attempting to find a solution. Amidst their conversation, a desperate cry for help pierced the air from behind them. Killian, Recognizing the voice as Britain's, confirmed its source. Aaron puzzled over the unexpected presence of Britain and Luna, recalling that they were supposed to have returned to their own territory. Kazal, sensing something amiss, directed Aaron's attention to the source of the voice, revealing the looming figures of the Ancona orcs. 
Aaron's face broke into a determined smile as he rushed toward the commotion, eager to confront the new challenge head-on. Meanwhile, Britton found himself in a precarious situation, attempting to fend off the encroaching orcs in a state of palpable fear. Luna, observing from a distance, harbored doubts about the wisdom of remaining by Britton's side. In a flashback to a few moments earlier, Luna confronted Britton, admonishing him for his reckless actions. She emphasized the gravity of pointing his sword at young Lord Aaron, equating it to a direct threat against the Empire itself. Luna warned Britain of the consequences should he choose the path of rebellion. Luna's demand for Britain to sever ties with the Sirod family caught him off guard. Britain pleaded with Luna not to cast him out, promising to ensure her safe passage to the Sirod territory. Luna, unmoved by his plea, reminded Britain of his original duty to protect her. She made it clear that his fate would now be decided by her father, leaving Britain to ponder his uncertain future. In the present moment, confusion reigned as the Ancona orcs confronted Britain, questioning his hostile stance. Aaron's sudden arrival startled everyone, prompting Britain to dash towards him. Aaron, taken aback by Britain's unexpected presence, pondered how Britain had ascended to the rank of knight. As Killian and the remaining Pendragon forces emerged from behind, Warning Aaron of the danger of facing the orcs alone, the orcs recognized the Pendragon flag. The leader of the orcs surmised that the man before them must be Aaron Pendragon himself. The orc conveyed a desire to speak with Aaron, prompting a release of his formidable aura. Killian and the other soldiers found themselves immobilized and breathless in the face of its overwhelming power. Sensing the imminent danger, Killian urged Aaron to retreat, but Aaron dismounted from his horse surprising everyone. With calm determination, Aaron strode towards the orcs, instructing Killian and the Pendragon soldiers to remain where they were and refrain from drawing their weapons. He assured them that he alone would handle the situation. The orc leader's excitement grew upon hearing Aaron's resolve. Aaron addressed the orcs, confirming their identity as the Ancona orcs. Karuda, one of the orcs, approached Aaron with a challenging tone. In response, Aaron's smirk turned into a swift headbutt directed at Karuda, sending him crashing to the ground. The other Ancona orcs erupted into laughter at the unexpected sight of one of their own being bested by a human. Killian and the others looked on in surprise at Aaron's bold action. Karuda, still recovering from the blow, questioned Aaron's intentions. Aaron countered with the same question, reminding Karuda of the Ancona orcs' agreement with Pendragon which forbade them from leaving the forest. Aaron pointed out the violation of this agreement by the orc's presence outside the forest. Karuda shifted blame to Aaron, claiming that Aaron's failure to form a pact with the guardian deity of the forest had led to their disobedience. According to Karuda, the Ancona orcs only obey the strong, and since Aaron was no longer considered equal to the guardian deity, they saw no reason to heed his commands. Aaron pondered Karuda's words, realizing that the guardian deity of the forest must indeed be Soldrake. Karuda declared to Aaron that the Ancona orcs had ventured out of the forest to claim the territory and revel in battle at their whim. In response, Aaron acknowledged the strength of the Ancona orcs, but expressed his understanding that they wouldn't simply follow his commands. He explained that his purpose in confronting them directly was to negotiate, despite knowing their reluctance to comply. Aaron questioned Karuda about his decision to drop his weapon upon seeing Aaron unarmed. Karuda admitted that Aaron's awareness of Orsish rules, despite being human, impressed him. Aaron affirmed his familiarity with these rules, emphasizing the code of honor that dictated one-on-one -on -one combat and the absence of weapons when the opponent was unarmed. Proposing a duel following the Ancona Orcs rules, Aaron and Karuda charged at each other. As Karuda attempted to strike Aaron, Aaron swiftly dodged the blow. Observing Karuda's strength and agility, Aaron acknowledged the superiority of the Ancona orcs over their ordinary counterparts. As Aaron soared through the air, Karuda seized the opportunity, aiming a powerful punch at Aaron's leg. Aaron braced himself and absorbed the blow head-on, causing shock among Killian and the others witnessing the scene. Upon landing, Aaron examined his feet and realized that his armor had sustained damage. Despite acknowledging the undeniable might of the Ancona orcs, Aaron couldn't shake the memory of faster opponents from his past encounters. 
Asserting that Karuda wasn't giving his all, Aaron challenged him to unleash his full strength. Karuda, however, explained that he held back against humans, deeming them incapable of withstanding the Ancona orcs' assaults. He resolved to reserve his full power only for those who could match his strength. Aaron urged Karuda to escalate the confrontation. Recognizing Aaron's resilience, Karuda commended him as an intriguing adversary and surged forward with intensified ferocity. Despite Aaron's best efforts to evade, Karuda's lightning-fast attacks left him struggling to keep pace. In a desperate attempt to defend himself, Aaron raised his hands, but Karuda's devastating punch connected squarely with Aaron's defenses, delivering a punishing blow. As the dust settled, Karuda couldn't shake the feeling that his punch had landed, yet something felt off. To his surprise, Aaron emerged relatively unscathed, having managed to block Karuda's attack with only minor injuries. Aaron attributed his weakened state to facing nothing but small monsters recently, a fact that caught the attention of both Killian and Luna. The orcs, on the other hand, cheered at the unexpected resilience displayed by Aaron. Killian, astonished by Aaron's endurance after taking a direct hit from an orc, pondered the rarity of a human triumphing in a one-on-one -on -one battle against such a formidable opponent. Recognizing Aaron as the esteemed heir of the Pendragon Duchy, Killian felt the weight of responsibility to prioritize Aaron's safety above all else. He swiftly ordered the soldiers to provide cover for Aaron, intending to draw the orc's attention away. However, Aaron intervened, commanding Killian and the soldiers not to move. He declared that the fight was solely between himself and the orc, forbidding any form of cover. In an unexpected turn, the orc mage began to applaud Aaron's display of courage and resilience. Acknowledging Aaron's resilience in facing Karuda, the strongest of the Ancona orcs, the mage commended Aaron for his steadfastness amidst the battle's intensity. Aaron, facing Karuda head-on, remarked that the encounter served as good rehabilitation allowing him to rekindle the familiar sensation of combat. He declared his intention to get serious, fully engaging in the duel. Karuda, surprised by Aaron's endurance after receiving his punch, noted the severity of Aaron's wound and predicted the duel's imminent conclusion. However, Aaron confidently asserted that his healing ability rendered the wound inconsequential. Karuda watched in amazement as Aaron's wound miraculously vanished, finding the display fascinating. Expressing his admiration for Aaron, Karuda charged forward, wielding his formidable strength. With a swift strike, he attempted to pummel Aaron with a hammer fist. However, Aaron evaded the attack with nimble agility. In his mind, Aaron strategized, recognizing that to defeat Karuda, he needed to neutralize the orc's movements first. As Aaron analyzed the situation, he recognized the simplicity of the orc mindset and saw an opportunity to leverage his healing ability in combat against Karuda. He understood that by incorporating his healing into his actions, he could gain the upper hand and defeat the formidable orc. Karuda charged at Aaron, questioning the apparent decrease in Aaron's energy and expressing his dissatisfaction with Aaron's evasion tactics. In response, Aaron pointed out the lack of versatility in the Ancona orc's fighting style, frustrating Karuda. As Karuda launched his attack, Aaron swiftly maneuvered, anticipating Karuda's movements. With calculated precision, Aaron positioned himself to receive Karuda's kick on his arms, sustaining injuries in the process. Killian, observing Aaron's injury, grew concerned for his well-being. Karuda, believing he had effectively incapacitated Aaron, declared the duel finished. However, to Karuda's astonishment, Aaron seized his leg, asserting that it was Karuta who would be defeated. Shocked by Aaron's resilience, Karuda doubted his earlier assumption that he had severely injured Aaron's arm. Karuda couldn't comprehend how Aaron was still able to move his injured arm. He speculated that this must have been Aaron's plan all along. Suddenly, Aaron leaped onto Karuda, delivering a powerful kick directly to his face. Karuda staggered and collapsed to the ground, stunning Luna and Killian with the unexpected turn of events. Meanwhile, the orc mage observed the scene with a smile, while the other Ancona orcs erupted into excitement at witnessing Karuda's defeat at the hands of a human. Amidst the commotion, they hailed Aaron Pendragon as a formidable warrior, acknowledging his strength. As Killian hurried towards Aaron, 
urging him to tend to his injured arm immediately, Aaron reassured him that it wasn't a serious injury. However, Killian couldn't fathom Aaron's nonchalant attitude toward the wound. Meanwhile, Aaron grimaced as he felt the discomfort of his arm healing, reflecting on the pain of regeneration compared to the injury itself. Despite this, he felt gratitude for the remarkable healing power that had been bestowed upon him. Once his arm had fully healed, Aaron approached the Ancona orcs and commanded Karuda to submit to him. Karuda, acknowledging the rule of the loser obeying the winner, inquired about Aaron's intentions. Aaron revealed his plan to launch an attack on the Ancona forest and sought the orcs' assistance in this endeavor. Karuda, surprised by Aaron's audacity, questioned why he would venture into the forest after being defeated by the guardian deity. Aaron disclosed his intention to open the mausoleum, leaving the Ancona orcs astonished. Karuda then questioned whether Aaron planned to form a pact with the guardian deity. Aaron affirmed Karuda's speculation, emphasizing the perilous journey that lay ahead through the treacherous territory leading to Soldrake's domain. He pointed out that the Ancona orcs would now have the opportunity to engage in battle every day, a prospect that excited the orcs. They boasted of their strength, confident that they could swiftly overcome any monsters weaker than themselves and reach the mausoleum in record time. With determination, Aaron retrieved his sword, prompting all the Ancona orcs to bow before him. He declared that henceforth, they would devote themselves to Pendragon and eagerly anticipated their contributions. Luna, impressed by Aaron's newfound leadership, observed the scene with admiration. As Aaron prepared to advance, he turned to Luna and offered her a contingent of soldiers to escort her safely to the Syrid territory. He expressed his desire for Luna to reach her destination without incident, prompting Luna to express her gratitude and apologize for past transgressions. Before departing, Aaron addressed Britain, warning him sternly against ever raising his sword against him again. Britain, intimidated by Aaron's resolve, nodded in acknowledgement as Aaron led his forces away from the scene. Emerging from behind, Luna steps forward, her gaze fixed upon Aaron Pendragon with a sense of certainty. She believes wholeheartedly that Aaron will honor the pact with the dragon and unlock the mausoleum. Luna is deeply impressed by Aaron's determination and resolve, feeling assured in his capabilities. As night falls, the group finds themselves at the edge of the Ancona forest. Aaron, filled with anticipation, sees this moment as the beginning of the battle he was destined to fight. With resolve in his heart, Aaron prepares to embark on the journey that will define his legacy. As Soldrake senses Aaron's presence, she reflects on his arrival and the task ahead. Soldrake believes that Aaron has come to prove himself worthy of finding the gates to her domain, despite not carrying a Pendragon soul. The scene shifts to the Ancona Forest Valley, where the Ancona orcs and Pendragon soldiers are locked in battle with small monsters. Amidst the chaos, a yellow-haired soldier is overwhelmed by snake-like creatures. Unable to defend himself, he faces imminent danger until Aaron steps in, swiftly dispatching the monsters and saving the soldier's life. Grateful for Aaron's intervention, the soldier expresses his thanks. Aaron then instructs Kratul, the orc mage, to tend to the injured. Kratul reassures the soldiers, promising effective medicine to treat their wounds and ensure their recovery. Approaching Aaron, Killian inquires about any injuries. Aaron assures Killian that he is unharmed and asks after the soldier's well-being. Killian reports that there weren't many casualties due to the fewer monsters encountered across the river. As the forces continue their march, Killian worries about the soldiers' stamina if they have to engage in combat with monsters again. Aaron, seeking information about their proximity to Soldrake's domain, turns to Karuta for guidance. Kiruta explains that they are not far from the quarry ruins, beyond which lies a cave leading to the guardian deity's domain. He assures Aaron that the journey to the quarry ruins should be safe as it falls within the Ancona orcs' territory, and any threats are minimal, mainly from creatures seeking water. Encouraged by this information, Aaron decides to press on to the quarry ruins before nightfall. He plans for the soldiers to set up camp there and search for the cave entrance at dawn. Aaron emphasizes that if they encounter any enemies along the way, he and the orcs will handle the situation. With his orders given, the forces depart, determined to reach their destination swiftly. 
Upon hearing Aaron's plan, both Killian and Karuda nodded in understanding. As night fell, the Pendragon forces arrived at the quarry ruins, only to find the entrance blocked. Aaron turned to Karuda for an explanation, who informed him that according to the Elder Orcs, goblins had once mined in the area. However, they had mysteriously vanished, leaving the ruins deserted. Seeking further information, Aaron questioned Kazal about the fate of the goblins. Kazal, having not resided in the forest, admitted ignorance on the matter, remarking on goblins' propensity for theft rather than labor. Aaron acknowledged the truth in Kazal's observation. With uncertainty looming, Killian sought Aaron's guidance on their next course of action. Aaron decided that, with nightfall upon them, it was best for the soldiers to remain at the ruins. He instructed two orcs to stand guard while Killian arranged for the soldiers to rest in tents. Killian agreed to Aaron's plan, preparing to ensure the soldiers' comfort and safety for the night. Aaron instructed Killian that both soldiers and orcs should take turns keeping watch. Killian agreed to relay the message to the others. As night fell, the camp settled into a restless slumber. An orc stood guard from a vantage point above, while a soldier kept watch near the tents. Suddenly, a yellow-haired soldier heard a noise and ventured into the forest to investigate. In an instant, he was ambushed and incapacitated by an unseen assailant lurking in the darkness. Meanwhile, inside his tent, Aaron couldn't shake a sense of unease. He pondered the mysterious disappearance of the goblins in the area, wondering if they had been erased rather than simply vanishing. Outside, a dark figure cloaked in shadow stood atop a cliff, summoning dark forces. Sensing danger, Aaron emerged from his tent just as a monstrous creature lunged at him. With lightning reflexes, Aaron dodged the attack, ready to confront the threat head-on. As Aaron processed the situation, he realized the unsettling truth behind the goblin's disappearance. Reacting swiftly, he unsheathed his sword and swiftly dispatched one of the wolf monsters. The noise of battle roused the soldiers, orcs, and Killian from their sleep, prompting them to emerge from their tents. Killian was astonished to find Aaron single-handedly engaging the wolf monster. With a decisive strike, Aaron defeated the creature, but Killian and Karudo approached him, seeking an explanation for the chaos. Their shock deepened as they beheld the skeletal remains of the goblins who had once mined in the area. Aaron explained that the culprit behind this sinister manipulation of the dead was none other than a lich. Aaron elucidated that only a lich, a powerful sorcerer capable of controlling the dead, could orchestrate such an act. He deduced that the lich had eliminated the goblins and enslaved their corpses to thwart Aaron's efforts to open the mausoleum and forge a pact with the dragon. Realizing the dire situation they faced, Aaron warned his forces that they were already surrounded. However, he cautioned against engaging the monsters directly. Instead, he urged them to focus their efforts on neutralizing the lich, recognizing that doing so would offer them the best chance of survival. With resolve in his voice, Aaron declared that he would locate the sorcerer's true body and defeat it, emphasizing that until then, the orcs and soldiers must hold off the monsters. Upon receiving their orders, the soldiers and orcs charged into battle, engaging the horde of goblins. The orcs displayed remarkable prowess, swiftly dispatching multiple goblins with each strike. However, the sheer number of foes posed a daunting challenge. Observing the chaos, Killian reflected on the nobles who sought to obstruct the resurgence of Pendragon power. Despite their efforts, Killian vowed to thwart their schemes, spurred on by his faith in the transformed Aaron. Killian admired the newfound determination of the young lord, recognizing Aaron's unwavering commitment to his duty and the legacy of his predecessors. He believed that the current Aaron possessed the strength and conviction to control the dragon and restore the Pendragon family to its former glory. With renewed optimism, Killian envisioned a future where the Pendragons reclaimed their rightful place of prominence. He resolved that his days of servitude and despair were over, confident that the Pendragons would rise again under Aaron's leadership. As the proud knight of the White Dragon Duke, Killian stood resolute amidst the chaos. Goblins unleashed a barrage of arrows aimed at Aaron, prompting him to realize the monsters were targeting his life. Determined to protect himself and continue his pursuit of the lich, Aaron swiftly dispatched a snake monster with his sword 
and deflected the incoming arrows. Amidst the fray, Aaron pondered the interconnectedness of the Pendragon House's downfall and the Vault House's exoneration. He speculated that those meddling with the Pendragons might hold clues to uncovering the truth. With unwavering resolve, Aaron vowed to defy the wishes of the Raven and restore his family's power. He saw the interference as an opportunity to unearth the secrets surrounding the Vault House's honor. As Aaron triumphed over a formidable adversary, he surveyed the battlefield and noted that the larger monsters had been vanquished, signaling a turning point in the battle. With determination burning in his eyes, Aaron pressed forward, ready to confront whatever obstacles lay ahead in his quest to restore the Pendragon legacy. As Aaron surveyed the battlefield, he grimly acknowledged that even with only the goblins remaining, the Pendragon forces stood little chance against their overwhelming numbers. The presence of a lich added another layer of peril to the situation. In an abrupt twist that left Aaron reeling, a shadowy figure materialized behind him, a dark mage. Liches, those accursed sorcerers who had bartered away their souls for immortality, stood as defiance against the very laws of nature. Their malevolence rendered them prime targets, even in realms as tolerant of magic as this empire. Liches, driven by insatiable ambition, spared no extremity to fulfill their sinister desires. Thus, it came as an anomaly when the Empire tasked the Rakshasa unit with their eradication, a mission often fraught with heavy casualties. The scene then transitions to a haunting memory, where Raven and fellow soldiers were deployed to vanquish a lich. Without warning, comrades fell like leaves in a tempest, leaving Raven bewildered by the sudden carnage. As Raven's gaze fixated upon the motionless lich, a chilling realization dawned. The hand of sorcery was at play. Though tales of liches had only existed in myth, Raven's certainty solidified as the truth unraveled. The lich's most potent ally, invisible to mortal eyes, yet undeniably present, a wraith. Invisible to human eyes, these spirits wielded sickles of death. A mere touch meant instant demise. Returning to the present, Aaron's swift blade, intercepted the wraith's lethal strike, though comprehension eluded him. As Aaron's sword deflected the unseen threat, Killian's urgent cry shattered the chaos, alerting Aaron to the sudden demise of their comrades. With dread creeping in, Aaron spotted the wraith poised behind Killian, narrowly guiding his ally away from the deadly sickle. Bewildered, Killian struggled to grasp the unfolding peril. Meanwhile, Aaron's mind raced with grim understanding. Wraiths possessed an ominous presence, unfamiliar to those unacquainted with their malevolence. Compounding the danger, these spirits persisted until their summoner met their end. Aaron's realization struck with chilling certainty. Multiple wraiths lurked in the shadows. Faced with a dire dilemma, Aaron weighed the options. To confront the Lich and risk the annihilation of Pendragon's forces by a horde of skeletons, or to remain, safeguarding the soldiers from the unseen threat, knowing the wraiths would persist until the sorcerer's demise. In Aaron's mind, the realization dawned that Tata and Kazal, blessed with superior night vision, couldn't track down the elusive lich. This wasn't just any mission for the Rakshasa unit. These Pendragon soldiers were comrades he couldn't afford to lose. Determination surged within him as he sought a solution. Suddenly, Kratul emerged from the shadows, offering his aid. With a confidence born of divine gift, Kratul unleashed his special magic, a boon from the god of earth. Tree branches sprang forth at his command, swiftly dispatching the encroaching monsters. Witnessing Kratul's formidable magic, Aaron urged him to employ it against their unseen foe. However, Kratul cautioned against haste, explaining the meticulous preparation required for such potent spells. Yet, he assured Aaron of his unwavering support, and unveiled the rarity of this particular spell. It was a one-time opportunity. With Kratul's magic guiding them, Aaron followed the ethereal trail, tracing the aura as it shimmered through the air. Eventually, they reached the precipice where the lich awaited, its sinister presence looming over the cliff's edge. As Aaron pinpointed the lich's location, Kratul assured him they'd manage the remaining goblins. With resolve, Aaron dashed towards the looming confrontation. Amidst Karudo's skirmish with the goblins, Aaron appeared, urgently informing him of the lich's position overhead. 
With a collaborative effort, Aaron leapt onto Karudo's outstretched hand, propelling himself onto the cliff's edge. As Aaron confronted the Lich, wasting no time, his strike was met with the Lich's formidable defense. Observing the Lich's retreat, Aaron calculated that the Wraith likely joined the fray. With only the goblins left below, Aaron sensed the soldiers nearing their limits, spurring him to hasten the battle's conclusion. Yet, the Lich thwarted Aaron's advance with a spell, momentarily halting his movement. Swiftly evading the Lich's subsequent attack, Aaron prepared to retaliate. But before his strike could land, the Wraith emerged from behind, sickle poised to strike. As Aaron narrowly dodged the Wraith's attack, he surmised that the spectral entity aimed to shield the sorcerer. Frustration gnawed at him as the Wraith's interference thwarted his approach to the Lich. Determined to sever the connection between them, Aaron strategized his next move. However, his plans were interrupted as the Lich unleashed a burst of flames, catching Aaron off guard. Anticipating another assault, Aaron braced himself, realizing that dodging would be futile if the Wraith intervened again. True to his fears, the Wraith materialized behind him, sickle poised for a strike. In a moment of desperation, Aaron's swords emitted a brilliant blue aura, deflecting the Wraith's attack. The Lich, bewildered by this unexpected turn, struggled to comprehend the situation unfolding before him. Suddenly, a mysterious voice resonated within Aaron's mind, prompting him to reveal his identity. As the voice beckoned him to prove his worth, Aaron recognized it as Soul Drake's. His eyes transforming into those of a dragon, Aaron gained newfound clarity, easily discerning the wraith's presence behind the lich. Upon laying eyes on the lich, Aaron realized it was his first encounter with a wraith. As the malevolent spirit moved to strike, Aaron unleashed his sword's blue aura, swiftly dispatching the wraith in an instant. With the spectral menace vanquished, Aaron advanced towards the Lich, sword poised for the final blow. Declaring an end to the conflict, Aaron channeled the aura of his sword, delivering a decisive strike that felled the Lich. As the last remnants of the goblins ceased their movements, Kratul acknowledged Aaron's triumph, recognizing him as the one who had defeated the Lich. The scene transitions to a few moments later, with Aaron nestled in his tent, his sword clutched tightly in his hand as he sleeps. In the depths of his dreams, memories unfold before him. Visions of Raven, wrongfully branded a traitor, and the tragic downfall of the Raven family. Amidst the swirl of memories, glimpses of the Pendragon's previous incarnations flicker into view. Suddenly, Aaron jolts awake, disoriented by the rush of recollections. Emerging from his tent, he encounters Kratul, who questions Aaron's late-night vigil. Inquiring about Kratul's watch duty, Aaron learns of the orc's dedication to safeguarding against potential threats, mindful of the dangers that lurk in the darkness. Reflecting on the recent battle, Aaron remarks on the peculiar power of the Pendragon's cherished sword, Windows Scream, which had shielded him from the wraith's lethal sickle with an otherworldly force. Speculating that the aura flames may be linked to Soldrake, the guardian deity of the forests, Aaron muses on the mystical properties imbued within the sword. As Kratul listens intently, Aaron elaborates on Soldrake's extraordinary abilities, including the legendary dragon's keen insight that transcends the ordinary. Yet, amidst this exchange, Aaron grapples with the enigmatic connection between his true identity as Raven and the inexplicable convergence of his dreams with Aaron's reality. Sensing Aaron's troubled expression, Kratul queries if everything is all right. However, Aaron's gaze towards Kratul is laced with anger, causing Kratul to recoil in fear and ask why Aaron is looking at him that way. Swiftly composing himself, Aaron offers a quick apology, attributing his demeanor to fatigue. Relieved but still concerned, Kratul advises Aaron to get some rest. The following day dawns, and as Aaron and his forces approach the cave, Karuto, Kratul, and Killian share a sense of foreboding emanating from its depths. Killian remarks on the unusual reaction of creatures with senses keener than humans, indicating that there's something significant within the cave. Aaron, too, feels a sense of frustration as he reflects on the past and the looming presence of the mausoleum above the cave. Despite his uncertainties, Aaron can't shake the feeling that Soldrake may be awaiting his arrival. 
Raven understands that he requires the power of the dragon to exact revenge for the Vault family's injustices. Additionally, Aaron feels compelled to seek answers from the White Dragon regarding the events of the battleground and the peculiar reincarnation of Raven as Aaron Pendragon. Aaron is convinced that the White Dragon possesses crucial knowledge. With resolve in his heart, Aaron commands his forces to venture into the cave, determined to uncover the truth. As Aaron and his forces progress through the cave, Karuto leads the way with his keen senses, guiding them towards the mausoleum. Witnessing Karuto's impressive abilities, Killian is struck by amazement. Aaron explains to Killian that orcs possess an acute sense of smell and can perceive subtle changes in airflow, making them ideal guides in such environments. Suddenly, Crudel halts their advance. Concerned, Aaron inquires about the reason for the pause. Crudel reveals that he can sense the presence of spirits nearby. They look up to see ethereal beings swirling through the air. Ahead lies a waterfall, prompting Crudel to warn them about the potential presence of a water spirit. Aaron questions Crudel about the danger posed by the water spirit. Crudel explains that while spirits are generally harmless, in this desolate cave where life is scarce, the rules may differ. He elaborates that spirits inhabiting such barren places often exhibit abnormal behavior, indicating potential danger. Upon hearing Crudel's assessment, Aaron's mind races with possibilities. Killian queries Karuto about the necessity of passing through the waterfall. Karuto confirms that there are stairs concealed behind the cascade, likely leading to the cave's exit. Aaron's attention is drawn to a glimmer within the waterfall, resembling a board. Crudel, too, is taken aback by this revelation. Suddenly, the water spirit materializes before Aaron and the others, startling them. To their surprise, the spirit manifests in the form of a turtle and launches an attack on the Pendragon forces. Crudel explains to Aaron that the shining object he spotted is likely the coveted treasure. The presence of the water spirit suggests that the treasure holds considerable value. Realizing the spirit's intention to protect the treasure by eliminating intruders, Aaron resolves to confront it alone. As the water spirit prepares to strike, ready to face the imminent danger, Aaron steps forward, positioning his sword in front of him, and commands the water spirit to cease its aggression. A gentle blue aura emanates from Aaron's sword, compelling the spirit to retreat. As the spirit dissipates, Aaron discovers a shield hidden within the waterfall's depths. With a gesture of generosity, Aaron presents the shield to Killian, who identifies it as the water spirit's prized possession. Impressed by Aaron's unexpected display of power, Crudel commends him, marveling at his ability to repel the water spirit. Crudel inquires about the sword Aaron mentioned the previous night, Widow's Scream. Aaron confirms its significance, though uncertain of the reasons behind its influence. Karudo suggests that the sword's power is attributed to the forest's guardian deity, Soldrake. Killian concurs, acknowledging that Soldrake's power is synonymous with Pendragon's power. Reflecting on this revelation, Aaron realizes that Raven's reincarnation may not have been solely influenced by Raven's own abilities. With this realization, Aaron and his companions finally arrive at the mausoleum. As Aaron approaches the entrance of the mausoleum, his sword begins to emit a radiant glow, its vibrations echoing through the air. Sensing the sword's agitation, Aaron draws it forth, announcing their arrival at the mausoleum. Suddenly, a dense fog billows from the door, concealing the figure of someone approaching. With apprehension gripping his heart, Aaron alerts his comrades to the looming presence. Yet, to their astonishment, the figure materializes into Gordon Pendragon, the former lord of the Pendragon house. Killian stands frozen in disbelief at the unexpected apparition. Observing Gordon's translucent form, Aaron ponders the surreal encounter, wondering how he knows the spectral figure's identity. It dawns on Aaron that these recollections stem from the memories of his past self. Amidst the surreal moment, Soul Drake descends from the sky, casting a spell of awe upon all who witness the majestic sight. Aaron's heart races as the white dragon alights behind Gordon Pendragon. Soldrake's voice reverberates through the air, posing a probing question to Aaron, leaving him stunned and speechless. As Killian and the orcs stand in stunned silence at the sight of Gordon Pendragon speaking, Aaron's mind races with revelations. 
He recognizes the voice he just heard as the same one from his previous life as Raven, echoing a meeting in Pendragon's tent. Aaron realizes that this voice belongs not to him nor to Gordon, but to Soldrake. The White Dragon is addressing him, not as Aaron, but as someone else entirely. Soldrake's inquiry pierces the air once more, demanding to know Aaron's true identity. With resolve, Aaron declares his full name as Aaron Pendragon. However, Soldrake descends closer, asserting that Aaron cannot deceive the dragon's keen eyes. The question lingers in the air, pressing Aaron for a response. Suddenly, a searing pain grips Aaron's head, causing him to collapse in agony. Memories flood his consciousness, a torrent of recollections and nightmares that he cannot escape. Aaron realizes that he is not witnessing these memories by choice, but that Soldrake is revealing them to him, unraveling the truth hidden within his past. As the white dragon draws nearer, its imposing presence looming over Aaron, the floodgates of memories burst open within Aaron's mind. Overwhelmed, he collapses to the ground, shocking Killian and the orcs witnessing the scene. Just as Aaron is on the brink of revealing his true identity to the dragon, a deluge of memories from his past life floods his consciousness. In the midst of this torrent of recollections, Aaron suddenly awakens, his resolve firm. He declares to Soldrake that his true identity is none other than Aaron Pendragon, heir to the Pendragon's ducal house. At this revelation, a smile graces Gordon Pendragon's face before he vanishes from sight. The roar of the white dragon reverberates through the air sending tremors through the soldiers and orcs struggling to maintain their composure. Soldrake descends toward Aaron, confirming that the pact has been forged between Aaron Pendragon and Ravenvault. Soldrake assures Aaron that he is the one destined to carry on the Pendragon legacy. Amidst the tumult, Killian, Tata, Kazal, and the other orcs rush to Aaron's side, concern etched on their faces as they inquire about his well-being. Aaron's voice resonates with triumph as he declares his success in forging a pact with the White Dragon. Killian and the others erupt into jubilation at this news, their faces alight with joy. Observing the scene, Karudo and Crudel exchange knowing glances, recognizing that young Lord Aaron is now poised to become the guardian of the forest, a position of great significance. Karudo remarks to Crudel that Aaron's strength was evident even in his victory over the Ancona orcs. Soldrake's attention is drawn skyward, prompting Aaron to inquire about the cause of the dragon's distraction. Soldrake's response sends a shiver down Aaron's spine as he realizes they have unwelcome guests approaching. Gazing upward, Aaron's astonishment mounts as he beholds six dragons descending upon their location. The dragons encircle the Pendragon forces, their imposing presence casting a foreboding shadow. One dragon, named Anyahalt, addresses Aaron as the queen's new partner, eliciting Soldrake's inquiry into their uninvited arrival. Soldrake questions why the six dragons have ventured into Soldrake's domain without invitation, given their lack of association with the pact forged between Soldrake and the Pendragons. However, Elagrain, a green dragon among them, interjects, signaling that their intentions differ this time. Elagrain asserts that they have come to Soldrake, as they believe Soldrake is aware of the reason for their visit. Soldrake, however, does not feel compelled to provide an explanation to Elagrain, prompting a moment of silence from the green dragon. Amuhalt then addresses Queen Soldrake, noting that the human before them emanates not only Soldrake's aura, but also those of both the dragon and demon gods. Soldrake responds with a resounding roar, sending tremors through the dragons in her presence. Firmly, Soldrake commands the uninvited guests to depart her territory immediately, asserting her authority as the Dragon Queen. Aaron is taken aback by this revelation of Soldrake's royal status. As the dragons prepare to depart, Amuhalt assures Soldrake that they will leave for now. However, Amuhalt cryptically hints that when that man eventually visits the rest of the dragons, clarity will dawn. With that, the dragons take flight leaving Karudo and Crudel bewildered by the exchange. Kazal remarks on the dragons speaking, prompting Crudel to explain that only those on equal footing with dragons can hear their voices. Before the pact, Crudel could also hear the dragons through Gordon Pendragon. However, now that the pact has been formed, only young Master Aaron can communicate with them. 
Aaron realizes that he was the only one privy to that conversation. Soldrake's voice did indeed change after forming the pact with him. More importantly, Aaron ponders the significance of the six dragons, the dragon god, and the demon god. There are too many mysteries that Aaron doesn't comprehend. Aaron wonders if Soldrake knows everything, including why Raven was reincarnated as Aaron. Aaron then asks Soldrake if he could lower her head, as his neck hurts from craning upwards. Soldrake responds to Aaron's request by suggesting a better alternative. With a graceful transformation, Soldrake takes on the form of a stunning woman with wings adorning her back. Aaron, Killian, and the orcs are taken aback by Soldrake's striking new appearance.